very influenced by the work on implicit cognition. That word implicit was very important. And we were looking for ways to study it. And in about 1995, uh, we took a paragraph from a research proposal that we had submitted to National Science Foundation, which spelled out an experiment in one paragraph, and actually did the experiment. And the experiment involved having subjects, I was the first subject, give the same response to words that meant things pleasant and names of flowers with one hand, and with the other hand, uh, give a response to words that meant things unpleasant and names of insects. A very easy task. Uh, but then, switching it, one minor switch, now give the same response to words meaning pleasant and insect names with one hand, the other hand words meaning unpleasant and flower names, immediately the task became hugely difficult. And the slowing on a response-by-response response basis was on the order of 300 milliseconds, which was a magnitude of impact that no one could have expected. We certainly didn't expect it. And when I experienced that slowing and found that I couldn't control it, I, repeating the task, I didn't get faster. I, if I tried to go faster, I just started making errors when I was trying to give the same response to uh, flower names and unpleasant words, for example. Uh, this was a mind opener. About a month later, I changed the task to, by replacing the flowers and insects with the names of famous white and black people. And I thought, well, this, you know, if this works for flowers and insects, maybe we can use it to measure in what we weren't yet calling implicit race attitudes, but eventually came to that. And to my dismay, but also some excitement, I discovered that the names of famous black people were functioning like the names of insects. I had a real, I had a difficult time responding rapidly when I was trying to give the same response to those and to pleasant words. Shortly thereafter, <coughs> excuse me, shortly thereafter, I tried to persuade this one to get students in her lab at Yale University uh, to work on this, knowing that she had some bright students there. Uh, and we uh, captured Brian Nozick, who became a very important person in this research. Maybe you can pick it up from there. Okay. So what is remarkable about this test, which hasn't been named yet, so I will give you its name, the Implicit Association Test, or for brief, in brief, the IAT, What's remarkable about it is that it allows you to be a subject in your own experiment. Most scientists don't have this amazing experience of being able to be participants in their own research. If you're a physicist, you can't you know, be the material object that you're studying. But if you're a psychologist, you can't because you know what the hypothesis is, so you can't actually be the subject. Here is this amazing uh, moment in which you can say, I think I'm going to show this response because that's what I am willing my hand to do and discover that your hand, which is responding to a signal from your brain, isn't doing what you want it to do. I think that's what's fascinating about the IAT and that's partly its, its appeal and this is why when we decided that when we were failing at a task, and by failing I mean this, that I intended to be able to associate white with good as quickly as I associate black with good. That was my conscious goal. And being unable to do that is, is just fascinating. It's fascinating to any human being when they discover that they can't do what it is that they are trying hard to do. We decided that this was not just for the scientific journals, which of course it needed to be, and that's where the debates and the uh, peer review take care of what it is that we are doing. But in 1998, we decided that this was probably worth exposing in a much, on a much broader scale. And so we decided to put it on the web. This was not um, a small task because people in our field haven't ever tried to do anything on that scale of taking a little laboratory task and putting it on a website and allowing anybody in the world to be a participant in the research. 
we thought, I was at Yale at the time, and one of the reasons I thought this was useful is that we don't want our results to come from only Yale undergraduates because nobody will believe that they're generalizable to real people. But being on the web would give us that access to a much broader sample. But we also, I also thought that, you know, this is a, this is a hard, it's hard to be at a, a small university and be able to get the large numbers of people to participate that people at larger state schools do. So I was somewhat selfish in wanting to think, well, maybe we'll get 500 people on the web instead of the 50 we get in, on our campus. And we were just stunned that in the first month after putting this up, with no advertising on our part, just media coverage of the work, we had 40,000 completed tests at the end of the first month. So we had clearly s struck some nerve, and people were just sending emails out to friends and family and saying, hey, take this test. And we were getting loads of email back, and in those early days, you know, we would have to break up the task of responding to people who were writing to us saying, this is a stupid test, I know who I am, and, and you know, I'm not a racist, and so on. Um, so I would say that, that, that the test is unusual in provoking this kind of reaction. So it is both a, a tool to understand what goes on in our minds that we may not be able to see directly, but it is also the moment in which people open their eyes to, to the question of, am I leading my life the way I actually want to? And this is a uh, very, um, I think, a really unique um, kind of a test for that reason.